sleep rock! That's Eat Sleep Rock. That is Helix. And uh, joining us tonight is the front man from that uh, awesome legacy band, Brian Vollmer. Brian, how you doing, man? I'm great. Awesome to have you here, brother, as usual. Um, I'm just going to set up the screens here so that uh, we can get you and I together here. And here we go. All right. So, uh, how you doing, man? How's the weather down in Florida? Fantastic. It's about 85 degrees today. Nice to be on the show. Oh, man. Shitty Ontario weather here. Wet and drizzly today here. Mm -hmm. I, I swear we're in England. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I know it, about that, too. My wife's English, so. Yes, you know all about that. Um, so when we uh, we left the show last time, that uh, this is the first show of the year, February or January the 4th. Great to have you here. We're going to be here the first Wednesday of every month with Brian. So, uh, you know, you've got questions for him. Uh, you can always throw them in the chat. And we're always pleased to, to get questions from people uh, that are tuning in to watch us here and do our thing. Um, we were talking about the heliograph last time. Uh, maybe you want to give people a quick recap on that. Well, the heliograph was our newspaper that we sent out to fans, and we used to sign people up between sets, and then we'd send it out and have all the upcoming dates on it and uh, stories about uh, members, different members. Sometimes people that work down at the office, um, just all sorts of things to interest the fans. And I of remember back at that time period, uh, there wasn't computers or, or things like that. So it was the only way we had to communicate with our fans. Yeah. I mean, such a novel way of doing that. Now, did that, did that happen all the way back in, uh, 74 when the band first got together? I think it started probably around 76 is when I started putting out that little newspaper. Right. So now you guys also used to have band meetings, I understand. We started off having band meetings, and uh, it's funny you mentioned that because I've been working on my book, The Golden Age of the Canadian Bar Circuit. One of the things that made us so successful as a band was the fact that we had weekly meetings, and that was the idea of our manager, uh, William Sype. And uh, at the weekly meetings, we would decide our game plan, and, as in learning new material, um, how to... Uh, uh, do certain things on stage, uh, who is going to introduce certain songs and, and uh, you know, how things were going. We'd, uh, if we had any differences with somebody else in the band, we'd usually work them out at the meeting. Although uh, some of it started to become uh, getting back at the guy that said something about <laughs> you the week before. But uh, in general, the business uh, acumen that we learned from those uh, early meetings uh, is what carried me through my career. Uh, stuff like always be honest. Uh, your word is your bond. Doesn't matter if you what you have on a piece of paper. Um, you know, right? And, that, and those are really, really great words to live by too. And 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 it's you know it, it makes it for a better world when people actually practice that too, right? Well, that's been my you know the way I conduct my business over the years. I don't know how other people do it, but. Uh, 
I've always found just being up front, being honest, and, um, you know, like being on time. There's another one. Uh, <laughs> we, we were always told that, uh, you know, you had to be on time because my time's worth just as much as your time. So after all these years, even Brent, you know, Brent's punctual, I'm punctual, Daryl's punctual. We're real sticklers on time. Your comment, your comment to me was um, um, about me when you first met me was, well, I kind of like the guy already because he's on time. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though, because you have to run a band just like you run any other business. You have to give good quality uh, uh, product. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, be there when you're supposed to be there. Uh, and um like I said, you have to be honest. And all yeah, your word, your word, as you said, your word. Time. Yeah, your word is your bond, right? That's right. Um, so when we we're back in back th at that point in time, you guys had these business meetings. You guys, did you guys discuss uh, things like strategy? All the time. Okay. We would learn songs off uh well first off we 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 decided very early on that we were going to uh unlike other bands who hid in the uh, the dressing room between sets that we were going to go out into the audience and go up to tables and ask people at the tables what they wanted to hear and then we decide from you know that feedback uh, the songs we were going to learn we also uh learning songs off of the top 100 of Billboard that uh, suited, uh, you know, our criteria. So we were always ahead of what was uh, going to happen in Canada because songs would get airplay in the United States. And, you know, a month later, two months later, they'd end up in right. Canada and we'd already be playing the songs. So we had to jump on uh, other bands. I got two more questions that came out of that. Just, uh, just thinking that when you said that, uh, one thing that caught my attention was uh, in the last show, you referred to yourselves as square heads. Because <laughs> we were mostly German. Right. So you're mostly German, but that whole European worth work ethic of you got to work hard. That's right. And we did. Right. We, yeah, and we, hard were, we were known as the hardest working band in Canada. We never stopped touring. We, we'd, uh, you know, we go out east, then we go out west, and we turn right around and go back out. So, I heard yeah. you guys. You guys used to sell albums after your shows or during That's, the shows. Well, we used to sell them between uh, sets. And yeah, so if you went out for a cigarette, you'd take a armful of albums with you. That's right, because back then you could uh, smoke in the club between sets. So that's right. Uh, but Bill. Our manager had a deal with us that uh, we got something like, I think it was either a buck or two bucks per album we sold. But if we hit the magic number of 25, then it doubled. So I always made sure that I always hit that double marker and made double the money because back then we were only making like $150 a week, something like that. And so, I'd be making more money selling T-shirts and albums. So I have a story there because from what I understood, you guys like sold something like 10,000 units that way. Yes. And that's uh, part of the reason we got signed to Capitol Records because we had sold so many uh, records before that independently. And, and was that now, was that 10,000 in total or was that the Breaking Loose album on its own? Well, actually, I think between the first two albums, we sold more like about 15,000 units. We were also selling uh, records through a distribution company called, I believe, Treble Clef right. in the United States. And that led to our first ever tour of uh, Texas uh, around, uh, I think it was around 79, around so you, there. So you guys Sorry. were like a, you guys were like a true indie band back in the day because you guys actually had your own label. That's right. H&S Records, which stood for Helix and Sipe. And uh, our first album did uh, very well down in the state of Texas, uh, mostly because of a guy named uh, Joe Anthony who worked for Kiss K-Mac out of San Antonio. So right. we, went down, we went down to Texas on this uh, first ever tour, and we felt like stars. And all our friends thought we were stars because we were going to play the United States because bands just didn't really do that back then. So exactly. we went down to Texas, and our first date was in Helotus. 
And we opened up for Y&T and Dave Menachetti, who uh, I played with several times since then over the years, great guitar player. And then from there, I think we went to Amarillo College, uh, where we were getting airplay uh, from a guy named Chris Johnson, who worked at the college radio station. I actually have that show on uh, uh, videotape. And then we played two clubs, mm -hmm. one, one in Houston and one in Dallas. I think they were the Bijou clubs. Yeah, and so, uh, so I, I mean, guess, you so got... We, came back, we were like stars, and uh, we did our first ever TV interview, which was on Global uh, at noon hour with Bob McAdory. And uh, <laughs> the funny thing about that interview was that... Uh, Sipey told us to dress up in, in, in uh, like, dress nice, like dress dress clothes, right? That's what he right. called them. And uh, we hadn't wore a pair of slacks or whatever for 10 years. So we both showed up, looked like a bunch of country bunkins with these <laughs> clothes we hadn't worn for years and years. Oh, and Bill man. kept going, now, now say this and don't say that and say this. And, and we were getting so uptight. And we got on on TV, and I, I could tell Brent was really, really nervous. And uh, Bob McAdory showed the uh, uh, film of us from from uh, Texas uh, of a plane down there. And then he turned to Brent and he says, "So, Brent, which you like better, Canadian audiences or Texas audiences?" And Brent went, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> "Joke, joke." And it was I like he he didn't know what to say, right? Because Sipe had. You know, but tell them, don't say this. Don't, you know. Yeah, be careful. And, to uh, say. We come off the, the, the TV interview and uh, uh, Bill was there with uh, Tom Tremuth, who ended up producing um, No Rest of the Wicked. And uh, Bill's going, you guys are drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and Brett says, that's it. I'm never doing another, another interview. Screw it. Oh, and my I, God. That's I, funny. That's freaking yeah. Wait, Now, what year was that, Brand? That would have been 1979, somewhere around there. Okay, so so like a five year span between the first album. Or, no, Actually, sorry, the first it album would have been later. It would have been later, probably more like 82, 81, somewhere. So around. this is after the first two albums, then. Well, not after. Yeah, yeah. I guess it would have been after. Yeah. So 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 we've we've got breaking loose, and then its follow up was white lace and black leather. Right. And so uh, White Lace and Black Leather. Now, which one did better of the two? The first one. Uh, the okay. first one was produced by Bob Morton, who also did Harmonium, which was a uh, right. Quebec group. And uh, they right. had the platinum albums back then. And then the second one was uh, produced by Lachlan McFadden, who had worked with uh, uh, Harlequin. And, right. uh, but it, it didn't do near as good. We, they were both recorded at Springfield Sound. Uh, down by London, Ontario, in Springfield, Ontario. Uh, and right. the studio was owned by Brian Ferryman, who ended up going on to uh, manage Michelle Wright. Right. It was actually owned by by Ferryman and Bob Leff. That was just uh, down the road from me, actually. Like, Spring uh, Springfield is like, you know, like 10-minute drive from me. Mm hmm Yeah. Holy crap. I don't Pretty think it's cool. a recording studio there now. But uh, Budgie no. recorded there. Yeah, Budgie recorded uh, an, uh, an album there as well, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, hey, listen. Um, so going back, thinking about those two those two first albums, they does it does it sort of meet that criteria of it takes you ten years to write your first album and one year to write the next? <laughs> no, I think it's exactly <laughs> because when you write your first album. You've taken all the influences that have uh, sunk into you uh, since you started listening to music and they all go to right. that first album and then it comes the second album and a lot of times it becomes a rehash of uh, what you did in the first album. And I, I think that's a killer for a lot of bands. Uh, luckily, we kept learning material and uh, we progressed from there, but um, I think the second album is actually harder. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to go back even further, further back in the begin, very beginnings of Helix, when you guys used to um, back up Del Shannon, and and so the interesting thing about that whole thing is, do you think that that experience working with Del Shannon made you guys better musicians? 
Mm, not really. Uh, I think there was okay. other things because because we only played with them for two weeks. So okay. Um, but it made you versatile. Well, it made us better musicians from the perspective that we had to learn all the material. <laughs> oh, there you uh, go. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a steep learning curve. Well, really, we were a green band almost right out of the basement. And what uh, Dram, uh, who was a booking agency, used to do is they they take young green bands like Helix, and we'd get paid like I don't know, a thousand bucks for the week, and Del Shannon would get like four thousand dollars a week. <laughs> and uh, the the artists like Del Shannon, Freddie uh, Cannon. Uh, you know, Tina Turner, Little Richard, whoever would fly in and the right. band would know the material. But I remember it took us like six months to learn all the, all the songs. And uh, right. the agency would come back, uh, come down periodically to the practice hall to make sure that we had, um, were learning the songs properly. And what really <laughs> freaked us out was when Dell finally got there. He started changing keys and throwing different oh, Jesus. In, and you know it took us all that time just to learn that. So um, there, there's yeah, got to be no experience and freaking out. Yeah, no doubt. So it would have been really challenging to you guys as musicians. Yeah, it, it was. It wasn't for me because I wasn't singing. Right, the only right. Time right. I sang with Del Shadows when I went up and sang "Run Around Sue." Right. Wow. That's just crazy, man. Um, but, uh, but that, that was, uh, again, stage time for you guys too, right? Well, we were playing two clubs that we never, we played the coronet, but we played the pit, which was right down the basement where all the choice hung out and we get right. mauled by, uh, some old wino, uh, when you were playing right? <laughs> and, and suddenly we were in the crown room, which was the top room with the coronet where all the, national acts played and then we went to the jockey club which was i think it was like a mafia type uh, uh club back then right and uh, you know what they called the a room, a room. <laughs> the a room hey listen i got well, a, I, I got well, a uh used to be the the uh, a circuit and the b circuit usually rock bands played the b circuit like they'd send you to places like hirsch ontario and Smooth Rock Falls and Timmins and places like that. Whereas bands that played the A rooms, like say uh, Copper Penny or uh, Major Hoople's Boarding House, they right. would play the Crown Room with the Coronet. They play the Water Tower in Sault Saint Marie, and uh, the nicer clubs that, that were out there at the time. Right. So two different two different uh, tiers of touring. Yeah, like I said, it was a difference between rock bands and. Show bands slash uh, uh, um, uh, international or well national recording acts. Right. Uh, so we got an audience question here. This comes from Andy Christ. Andy says, "Hey Brian, what's your favorite Helix song to play live? And is there any song you've? Re oh, there's two questions. So first of all, what's your favorite song to play live? Geez, uh, I don't know. They're all like little children when you write songs, <laughs> but." Uh, I really like doing uh, When the Hammer Falls, and I love doing uh, – actually, I know what my favorite song is. That's Danger Zone. I love doing that song. Danger Zone. Awesome. All right, so there we go. Is there any song you've recorded that you never want to perform live or don't like to play or refuse to play? <laughs> if I tell you, though, that might spoil some, uh, spoil it for some fan that likes that song. So. <laughs> So there's you're you're gonna take the fifth on that one. You're in America. You can okay. Do that. I, I'll I'll play it safe. Let me take you dancing. Okay. <laughs> that was a song that uh, Bill Sipe got us to record. It was written by Dave Lodge, the right. bass player for Major Hoople's Boarding House, and uh, right. we all hated the song. Hated. Oh, wow. And so uh, if Sipe, Sipe, <laughs> Sipe made us play it live, and I think maybe we played it once or twice, and then we went. Yeah, okay. mm -mm. doesn't song. work doesn't and, work and we recorded that after we were done playing at the ride out in london we had to drive to springfield and then record that so uh, song at night after the show and lodge got me to sing until i couldn't even talk i was totally hoarse right uh, and um it had trumpets in it and it was like he went let me take a dance and spend <laughs> the night with me 
uh, and uh, no. So you didn't. So you didn't want to do the. You didn't want to do the. I was made for loving you, babe. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> you were. You weren't going down that like road. That you weren't going down that road. I actually like that kiss song. <laughs> a lot of people that do. Yeah. Um, lots of sex appeal to that song. So listen, um, you, um, I want to bring you really forward really, really quickly, just to quickly, just because it's still fresh in my mind, the video eat, sleep, rock, yeah. man, that, that is you. That is us. You eat, sleep and rock. Yeah. That's pretty much what you got to do to be successful in this business. Right. And, 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 you have to live it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So in the uh, flash, in, in the flash forward, you're, you're talking about doing some intimate shows, right? No. Yes. We might do some acoustic songs. I was talking to uh, Sarah Smith. Yeah. Who I love like a sister uh, today yeah. and um, possibly have Sarah open some of the shows with us and play some smaller venues, but it's, it's going to be more of a theatrical presentation of the band we're going to hopefully build a set uh you know have stage props and things like that and uh two songs acoustically and in between the songs talk about you know maybe how the songs came about or certain time periods and and uh maybe even take questions from the audience yeah and when we're done when we're done uh, the show tonight i have an idea that i was going to run by us so i'll run it by you after the show because uh it leads into that. And I think it'll be helpful, by the way. Um, I love working with this guy because he he thinks like a musician, but he also has the heart of a businessman. Right? Are you talking about me? Yeah, talking about you. Like you, you you've really you're one of these guys that really took the the idea that music is also a business. It's not just you know, rock and roll that's here today and gone tomorrow. Well, I've always liked selling stuff. And as a kid, I used to sell Christmas cards. And when you <laughs> live on a farm, you know, like there's two miles between the farms and you're being attacked by dogs. And so uh, if you can do that, you can pretty much sell anything. But, uh, you know, if you don't have money, then you can't create your music. It's as simple as that because it takes money to... Uh, Going in, into the recording studio, it takes money to press albums. So uh, definitely have to think of money. Yeah, and and there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the stuff that you experienced. Um, you know, even from your early days, that other um, musicians could learn, other artists could learn from what you've done. Well there's no set way to make it in the music business, but we definitely had a blueprint for success. And, uh, you know, in the early days of the band, there was hardly any money and we didn't uh, waste money on anything. Uh, we kept track of every cent. I also found as you got bigger, it was hard to keep track of money. Um, but nowadays it's just me really running the band and uh, I run a tight ship, but I pay my guys well. And um, they're very loyal to me. Uh, but they know that, uh, you know, when they show up at the airport, they don't have six bags of clothing and and stuff like that. Uh, so, you know, we're very conscious of money because of the, the, what I tell my guys, I go, look, at, if we waste money, then there's less money to pay you guys more money. So that's right. So you always have to think about it in different ways to, to conserve and to, and to be able to plan things. And, um, you know, and also I might, I might add here too, that, uh, uh, you know, money allows you to keep, uh, uh, producing music and, uh, uh, like any other business, you have to set money aside to grow your business. So, we always made sure there was enough that we had it. We kept making, like people ask me, why do we keep putting out albums? Um, because that's what I do first off. But it also uh, uh, sets a precedent in people's minds that they know that uh, you're serious about what you're doing and that uh, you consider yourself an artist. You're not just doing a, a milk run around the circuit and picking up your check and going, see ya. 
<laughs> hey, listen, you uh, you referred back to when you were uh, living on the farm and selling Christmas cards to make money. How old were you when? How old, old were you when you did that? About thirteen years old. I think I sold most of the cards in the uh, and analysis to my grandmother, but uh, I made a <laughs> in the How many did your mom buy? I don't think my mom bought too much. <laughs> your grandma, your grandma took care of you yeah. that way. That's but a no, great way. I'd be out my bike, right? I'd have uh, all these cards and uh, a wrapping paper and stuff. Be driving around my bike, and you know, you'd be coming <laughs> in a laneway, and there were like three German shepherds running after the bike, nipping at my heels. Uh, I never got bit though. Tough Thank sales, God. man. But, you know, Tough sales. Two. No wonder you sold so many records, man. Yeah, like like you got you got your you got your uh, lumps early on learning how to sell. Well, you have to grow a pair to go up and just have enough courage just to ask people if they want to buy something. Now, when just, we, just when really we started to sell albums uh, and T-shirts between the set, uh, you know, I have to go around to the tables. A lot of times I get hassle and somebody would say something like, oh, are you doing this? Blah, 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 blah right? And uh, it was Brent that actually gave me the best line and I always shut people up. As soon as I start getting hassle, I just look them square in the eye and go, what do you do for a living? And that always shut them up because no matter what they said, they looked like a you know an asshole for uh, you know basically giving you know hassling you. And uh, I sold a lot of stuff, like I said, and I made a lot of friends too. And you learn how to do it in such a way that you're not going to uh, upset anybody, or you know, if you don't want to buy anything, that's fine, right? And you still talk, and you know, so people would know that, uh, you know, selling something wasn't the only reason you were at the table. Right. That you value them as a fan and wanted to hear what they wanted to hear and things like that. So you, you learn how to sell uh, just by doing it, I guess. It, it's, but it, I've it, always it, been in that and I'm still selling myself today because you have to sell yourself. If, you, if you're not willing to sell yourself, why do you expect someone else to be willing to sell you? True that, true that, true that, my brother. Um, you know, I think about what you guys did back then, and and you know, if artists were even to take that model today, um, and use that model of engagement, because it sounded like you know, you guys not only selling your music to your fans at shows when you went and played shows, there's that interaction that occurs during that process of, of selling them that album. In some cases, you probably didn't have to, it wasn't a hard sell. Well, like I said, we still have a lot of friends to this day that we met back then selling stuff in the bars or going around to tables and asking what songs they wanted to hear because we lived in the bars. So, you got, here's an interesting thing. So what you really told me so far, what I've learned about Helix, the original incarnation of Helix, up to the point that you guys got signed, you guys were every bit an independent band. We were one of the first bands in the world probably to have uh, indie albums. Well, here's an inter that's an interesting thing because now my friend Don, um, he, he he sometimes watches the show. He claims to me that Pat Benatar was the first um, indie artist, but I'm beginning to wonder if maybe you guys are right in the same ballpark. Well, we were we were selling albums uh, probably as early as 1978, 79. Because because uh, I know there was other bands out there doing it too. Crackers. Was a band on the circuit that sold. I remember album. Crackers. I remember them. Yeah, uh, I'm sure there was other ones, but uh, it was a rarity. It was like one in a million that bands did that. There, you know, in the nineties, it became the whole craze, right? But we were way ahead of our time because uh, all the record companies rejected us. Nobody wanted. They said right. we were dinosaurs. In fact, we used to use that in one of our press releases because. So They'd say, "Look at the, your your type of music's uh, dead as a doornail. Like, go away, quit bothering us." And we just wouldn't give up, and uh, we decided to do our own album. And our first album, by the way, was done with money from my grandmother, my parents, Brent's parents, and Brian's parents, uh, Bill Sipe and his mother. 
uh, once again, it gets back to belief. You have to believe in yourself. Uh, well, your your first release came out in what year? Breaking Loose came out? 79. 79. So we're talking five years from the time that the band was formed till the first album came out. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, you know, you look at that, that time span in there, that's a, a significant span of time for you guys to develop and, and have a whole bunch of material for a follow-up album. A lot of the stuff that was written for the first album was written on our first ever maritime tour. In fact, that's the first time we put an original set on stage. And, right. uh, the second album I think we wrote a lot of it out in Western Canada, but it wasn't, it didn't do as well as the first album. Right. Right. And yet but, the songs uh, on, I think the song, I, I mean, I think the songs are just as strong and, and maybe that might've been just, um, you know, sometimes you put out a second album and, and it doesn't do as good as the first and maybe you just couldn't get the right air under it. Well, I think the first album had two great songs on it, Your Woman Now and uh, Billy Oxygen. Right. And the the second album, uh, the biggest song off that album was a song I wrote called Women, Whiskey, and Sin, which get, uh, uh, garnered us a, a foothold in uh, Britain and became right. a number one import in uh, uh, England. So, uh, you know, different albums did different uh, things. But... Um, I think we were searching for our sound in those first two albums. And so, you know what I mean? Some people that might have liked the first album didn't necessarily like the second album, vice versa. Yeah. And and the cool thing about that is like, you know, it, it and it's not untypical for a band, you know, whether they're searching specifically for the sound that they want to produce. Um, and again, we'll, we're going to talk about that, that artistic license piece. Um, because sometimes when once you sign with a major label, you lose some of that artistic ground that you gained as an independent. But I don't know if that happened to you. Um, but we're going to talk about that. That's going to come out sometime in the interview. Um, and maybe not tonight, but definitely, uh, you know, an opportunity to talk about um, what musical well, direction that took you. The song that really started a sound for Helix was Check Out the Love. And that was written down in the uh, Bronx uh, while okay. we were down on a, uh, a tour in New England, a disastrous tour in New England. And uh, from there, we we knew we had, that was the sound we wanted. And we went out west on tour and we came back and we had this whole album written uh, a- after that tour. And it came very quickly. That whole first album uh, was probably written in about four weeks. Wow. That's crazy. And you know, something weird, weird tonight, weird tonight. We're, we're, I think we're reaching a bigger audience tonight because all of a sudden I'm getting these, um, spam mails in our chat. So I'm trying to weed them out as we're talking, Brian. So if you see me down here at the clicking away at the mouse, um, there's people are spamming our chat with, with, uh, you know, offers to promo this show and all that crap. So like, yeah. How do you kindly say that to somebody when they keep persistent with you and you're just not interested? What do you say to them? Not interested. <laughs> I'm sure you got other choice words you'd use, right? <laughs> I'm pretty mellow nowadays. I try not to get into it, people. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so you know, back you, in the day, I'd probably tell me half off, but you know, nowadays, you never know what's going to happen. Well, we released the uh, the the uh, first album, Breaking Loose, um, back in August um, on our label, mm-hmm. and that was the first digital release of that. And and I remember telling you, I said, "Oh, geez, if I had known that that never really had, um, if that if <laughs> how am I going to put this? Hmm. I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. <laughs> okay." Um, so when, when we were going to put the album out, it, it had never been released digitally before. And I was like, if I had known that I probably would have done a much harder release on it. Instead, it ended up kind of like one of these releases that went 
it was kind of soft, right? Um, we got it out to, we shopped it out to radio. We got it out um, to a few other places. I thought it was a, sort of a re-release, but I never realized it had never been released digitally. But nevertheless, it's got hundreds of thousands of streams now. So oh, that's great. I always like that, hard better than soft. Yeah. <laughs> well, next time we're going to next time we'll uh, put a little Viagra in it and make sure that it comes out nice and hard and doesn't roll over in bed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so that album came out and, uh, we've done, we did, uh, sort of a bit of a magic touch on it. There's just a little bit of, um, um, some slight changes to that album. When it came out, we went with a really uncompressed wave form on it and man, does it ever sound good? So you gotta, you gotta listen to it. You can actually listen to it off of our website at indytunes.com. Uh, Helix Music is there. Um, we're posting all the stuff right from the first album forward, and we're doing a whole discology of Helix on our website. And that is also being republished um, as we speak on Spotify and iTunes and all those great places, Brian. Yeah. So, well, like I said, the biggest thing for us nowadays, we make most of our money off live shows. Uh, yeah. A lot of times music is a, a van, you know, especially new music is a vanity project. But once again, I keep putting out music because that's what I do first and foremost. That's why I got in the music business was to create music uh, first and foremost and to perform and to tour and to, to live the, the lifestyle of doing that. Um, you know, so I just keep going on and and putting it out. <laughs> Here we go. Um, Tom says, this is Tom Jokey. He's my co-host um, on the show, one of my co-hosts on the, on the sh regular indie show. And Tom was a longtime producer for Chum FM. And he said, can I interest you in a podcast? He does a podcast with Christopher Ward. Oh, really? I know Christopher yeah. well. There you go. So there you go, Tom. Um, there's Is that your answer? You saying that you do a podcast with those guys? Sure. <laughs> there you go. All right. So Tom, I yes. I reward when he was uh, going out with Atlanta Miles. And oh, uh, really? and Christopher, had, uh, well, sorry, that's not true. I Christopher had, uh, interviewed me at Much Music. And then uh, I ended up seeing Atlanta Miles. That was it for the first time down at the Horseshoe because uh, her best friend was Heather Brown who did a lot of her album covers. So I went down there and Christopher Ward was going out with her. And uh, I remember that uh, I was sitting there going, this girl's blow away. Like, She's great. The songs are great. The band's great. And she came up to me and she went, do you think someday maybe I can back up Helix? And I went, right? And I said, you're going to be a star lady. And sure, I was right. <laughs> and uh, the next Monday, I actually phoned Dean Cameron at Capitol Records. I said, "Have you seen this uh, girl named Atlanta Miles? She's she's amazing. You got to sign her." And he went, "Ah, oh, we saw her. We passed." Oh and my God! Was, what a mistake that yeah, would have been. That's right. And uh, it was sometime later. I was working for actually uh, Bice Construction in London. I was working a real crappy job tearing out the brass rail, which is an old bar uh, right. in London. I remember and, that place. Uh, I was standing up to my ass in um, just dirt and grime and everything else. And the radio come on and it was uh, Atlanta Miles. I said, I know her. <laughs> and uh, when she finally came to uh, Centennial Hall in London, uh, me and my best buddy, Randy, we went out and, and uh, we saw the show. But uh, I remember we went into the dressing room. She was getting her makeup on and stuff. And, just give me a little peck on the cheek and you know oh man man so what year, what year was that, that 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 you were in in there and and heard Atlanta miles oh geez that would have been the 90 90 89 somewhere around there there we are there's another flash forward for you so uh we're we're going to flash back again back into the 70s going to take your mind back to the 70s again and uh, you guys had 
Um, you guys officially formed the band Helix in 1974. Now, between 74 and 79, when you guys recorded that first album, there was a lineup change, right? A lot of lineup changes. Yeah. The original so, band was uh, Bruce Arnold, myself, Ron Watson, Don Simmons, uh, Keith Zubrick, and Rick Trombley. So and, here, uh, here so, so next show, for next show, I'm going to get you to send me, do you got photographs of those guys? I'm sure you do, right? Yeah. yeah. We should put the photographs of them up on the next show. Sure. Okay. Two of those guys don't, uh, aren't alive anymore. Right. But they may have family who might catch this video and, 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 and appreciate that uh, honorable mention. Sure. Cause, uh, they were all part of, uh, the, the original, um, sort of formation of Helix, right? And they were both uh, great guys too. Uh, Ron yeah. Watson uh, and Don Simmons, they both passed away, uh, was it last year or the year before? Right. I've lost track of time lately. But, uh, you know, uh, I was lucky because I saw Ron Watson uh, the night we played at Maxwell's uh, in Waterloo. It was the night that I thought, the day that I thought the cr uh, Fritz was going to die from his accident. And oh, when he uh, fell off the ladder, when he fell off the ladder. And yeah, I, remember yeah. I was you know, that morning, his girlfriend had phoned me and said, I, oh, it's not looking good and blah, da And I'm driving into uh kitchen. I'm thinking, God, if, if, you know, Fritz dies or something, I'm going to, you know, this just be terrible. And, um, that's when I found the phone call that he came out of his coma and, uh, you know, he was, he was, you know, out of the coma. So anyway, we got there and we did that show and um, Jamie, Jamie Costas played. So you, going back there, you had four original members of the band. And when was the first lineup change? Well, I, what I was going to say, the last yeah. one, uh, train of thought. Uh, Ron Watson, I had set up before all this happened with Fritz. I had set it up with Ron Watson. I hadn't seen him for years. And I said, Ron, we got to get together at the show and like go for a coffee or something. So there's a Timmy's right beside uh, Maxwell's. And so uh, I met Ron over at, at the Tim Hortons and it was just crazy in there. And uh, but we had a nice little visit with each other. And um, I think it was like five months later where Ron passed away. He had uh, many operations on his spine. I think he had cancer or something. Wow. Uh, and uh, he was one tough cookie, Ron Watson. No he doubt about it. Stop smiling, that guy. Um, even with all the troubles he had in his life. Wow. And uh, I was really sad to see him go. Same thing with Donnie. Uh, I saw Donnie uh, uh, now and then uh, over the years, and he was always great. We played together at the uh, uh, 30th anniversary concert in uh, Brantford. And... Um, you know, we went to practice together, obviously, for that show. And uh, it was great to get reacquainted because, you know, a lot of these guys, once they left the band, uh, they didn't venture too far from where they lived and stuff. And I was on the road for all those years. So when I was off the road, I didn't really run into him. Uh, I'd run into Donnie, though, because Donnie was from my hometown, of uh, Listowel, Ontario. And okay. a few times I'd gone up and uh, taken my mom out for a meal at the local restaurant, and I'd seen him there. That is uh, crazy how these things all lead back to all these memories, Brian. Yeah, there's a lot of memories over the years, a lot of good people. Um, yeah, and you recall a lot of these stories. I mean, uh, you know, if I could even record some of the ones you've told me to date that I've been I've over to your place for visit, and, you know, you start telling me a story, and it leads to another story, and it leads to another one. You're a great storyteller, dude. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the, um, the interesting thing about what happened to you guys at the very beginning of things, you went through a lineup change. So that was your, when did you experience the first lineup change? First person to leave was, uh, well, Rick Trombley because Bruce and Ron, I think didn't want him in the band. So they fired him. And then I never saw the guy again. He just like disappeared. Uh, the next person was, um, going to say it was Bruce Arnold left the band uh, because he, he met his future wife to be, and they're still married to this day. Uh, there you Bond. go. And Bruce was kind of, I think that Bruce, once we got Bill Sipe, 
uh, uh, Bruce had been kind of leader of the band and then Bill kind of took over with our direction and everything else. Right. And uh, Bruce had less of a say, so that might have had a, a bit to do with it. But it was mostly because he, he, he met his wife. And uh, I still talk right. to Bruce to this day. Uh, he's another good friend of mine. Um, after that, it was, and then when Bruce left, then that's when Brian Derner came in. And, okay. oh, and then Don Simmons quit. And uh, in came Paul Hackman because we couldn't find a keyboard player. We put a, an ad in the paper, and uh, Paul phoned the office, and he said, "Look, you're not going to find a keyboard player." Wow! Says, because in my band, Whitehorse, he said <laughs> I needed a keyboard player, and he says I couldn't find one, so you're not going to find a keyboard player either. And so Bill's going, "Oh yeah, right, buddy." And sure enough, <laughs> he's a keyboard player. So Bill phoned him up, and when Paul came down. We were practicing out at Mrs. Sipes' barn in Baden, and it was the middle of winter. It was freezing cold. I think we had one of those uh, uh, um, heaters that you plug in and blew. Space like Space heater. <laughs> well, it wasn't a space heater. It was like a heavy-duty blow flames. But I oh, remember okay. it was so cold in the barn that Paul was wearing gloves as he was playing. And... Uh, after he said, how did I do? And we said, well, you know, he's good. You're good, but you got to learn how to play cleaner. <laughs> he didn't wear freaking gloves. Uh, but uh, Paul ended up being like, you know, the main guy in, in the band. And he was uh, my writing partner along with Brent. And um, he was definitely when he, you know, when he was killed in the 90s, uh, that really uh, slowed us down. And, and for a while there, it looked like the band might break up. He was that important to uh the chemistry of the band so it's a bit that's a huge loss and we want to talk about that that whole span between 74 and 79 because you guys did a bunch of shows a bunch of touring during all that time all leading up to that first album that's correct uh we started off we played uh locally <laughs> of course then we played northern ontario uh dram would send us up to places like Capus Casing and Hurst in the middle of winter, Smooth Rock Falls, Sudbury, Timmins. Um, and if you survive that, then they'd send you out to the Maritimes, always in the winter for some reason. And uh, <laughs> out there we play a place like Bathurst, Bathurst. We call it Bathurst. Uh, it was the first place we played out in uh, the Maritimes. But we also played a lot of universities. Uh, PI, and we are when you're touring uh, Canada, when you're touring Canada, you can't sleep in a van in the winter. Well, we didn't sleep in vans, but the motel <laughs> rooms all the times were pretty damn cold. No uh, doubt, no doubt. But when we played uh, the Maritimes initially, it was right in the middle of that transition of the bar circuit, where it was going from one nighters and transitioning into uh, bars and. Uh, we went out and played Bathurst, but then we played a lot of universities like uh, St. Xavier's. Uh, we played uh, uh, the Agricultural College in Truro. We played Zapata's, which was a bar up in Citadel Hill. I remember we pulled in and we saw Richie Oakley uh, playing. And Richie <laughs> Oakley came down to my table and he goes, oh, you have to excuse me, man. I'm just did some magic mushrooms and I'm not really here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we play, and every place we pretty well bombed in the whole East Coast until our very last week, and we played a place called the Hilltop Pub in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and we had people lined up a block long to get in to see the band. They just loved us there, and uh, we went back and on subsequent tours of Maritimes. And we made friends with a lot of people there, um, uh, and they ended up out in Alberta during the oil boom and. Uh, they come out to see us in bars like the airliner when we played in Calgary. So, uh, so here's another, here's another argument about the fact that you guys were like the, the sort of premier indie band at the time you were totally independent. You guys were marketing yourselves, right? You guys were building an organic fan base. I mean, holy shit. You guys had all have all those, those chemistry pieces put together pretty well. Well, we used other bands as models, too. One of the uh, uh, bands that we followed, uh, not necessarily music-wise, but uh, career-wise, was Rush. 
Rush was a band that just toured night after night after night after night. And uh, we used to hear stories where they had the same bus after the first, you know, three years on the road and stuff. And I think they played 73 one-nighters in a row at one point. And so we really admired Rush. And back then, you could, you could break a band by playing uh, live and going from town to town and developing a following. Uh, I don't think you can do that nowadays at all. But back then we could. And so we really uh, approached, approached it from that perspective with real, uh, real fervor. Uh, we were going to literally just go town to many places we could play and win over the uh, audience. And those were the, that was going to be the audience that was going to buy uh, records when we finally put them out. And that's what we did. And I might also add that I, I think that we're still around now almost 50 years later because we still have people come out that saw us in the bars back then. Uh, and, right. we, and we had that foundation uh, uh, from, from, from all the touring we did. I got, a, I, got a, I got a photograph here. This is off the thumb drive you gave me. Here we go. Do you remember when that photo was taken? Mm -hmm. I know exactly where it was taken. It was taken <laughs> a forest in, in Trenton, Ontario which was one of the grimiest, dirtiest, funnest bars we ever played. Uh, but it was like upstairs, it was all winos because it's a real um, uh, uh, um, Air Force town or, uh, there. Right. And uh, there was soldiers that, that was upstairs that had shell shock and living in the rooms. And uh, I remember there was one uh, hooker that lived upstairs there. And... Uh, when we came there to get a room, I remember my room. I always had the same room right at the front of the uh, uh, building. And sure. literally a mattress on the floor. So you had to bring your own blanket, sleeping bag, whatever. And on the wall of that room, there was a huge mural that had been airbrushed by the killer dwarfs. And it had a, uh, a little dwarf uh, playing bass, a uh, Rickenbacker bass. He was plugged into a giant jar of hash oil, and there was all <laughs> amphetamines all over drawn, right? It was really well done. And then on the oh other God, wall was a photographic version of the Family Circus, which was a, a comic strip uh, that used to be around at that time. Right. Now, can you see us still see the photograph okay there? Yeah. Okay, so tell me who's in the photograph. Let's go look from, the, from our, when, we, when we're looking at our left to the right. Uh, well, on the far left is Kenny Hay, and uh, Kenny uh, was our sound man, Lightman. He ended up working for um, uh, uh, Green Jelly uh, and uh, Melissa Outridge, Bette Midler, uh, Fleetwood Mac, and then eventually he went to the uh, Indianapolis Colts uh, working for Jim Irsey. Um, next beside him is Brian Derner, who played drums, of course, then Paul, who played guitar. Then me, that's me with the mustache. Uh, and uh, then Keith Zubrick, or Bert, and uh, finally Brent on the far right-hand side. Wow. That, now, what year was that taken? Do you know? That would have been around 1978, 79. Okay. So, so, be, so probably before the first album came out? Or right around that time? It would be around that time. Uh, Probably around that time period, yeah. I remember that this this club, by the way, burnt down. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was run by a guy, an, an old Jewish guy by the name of uh, Al Steinberg, and he was great. He he'd be like he was like a dad to me when I played there. He'd always be buying me a free meal on the Saturday afternoon, like a steak dinner or something, because he owned the restaurant. And right. um, uh, Al was great, but the but the hotel was something else. It was like it was one of these hotels that was never meant to have rock bands. Right. It was, it was ancient. So the wiring was all screwed up and there'd always be a hum coming through the PA and hisses and pops. And there was a pit down in front. And we played in this uh, kind of like cavern, uh, you know, where the roof come up like a, a half round bowl. Okay. And, um, upstairs, the rooms are just terrible. <laughs> like a, a diet, like, well, the first time we moved in, I'll never forget this. We had a roll equipment in the front door, and then because there was a, a like a, a porch railing around the pit, you had to go down the length of the, the railing, then around 
through the pit up onto the stage. Well, I was unpacking cords or something, and there was a table right beside the railing, and there was a, a, one of these old alcoholics sitting there with a great big pitcher, pitcher of beer, and he looked over at me, and he starts going, and there was bread <laughs> like coming out of his mouth as he was, like, chewing this, I don't know, a sandwich or bread or something. And uh, I went, oh, my God. <laughs> oh man the stories you've got uh, from from the days gone by so we're gonna we're going to uh ask one more question here this comes again from andy chris he says what year did you start videotaping the band's adventures and antics and you didn't actually videotape it you actually did super eight you began with didn't you i did super eight and it was around 1976 and um you know, over the years, I think I've lost some of that film, but uh, I still have uh, snippets from here and there. Uh, I think one of the first shots I had was when we went down to play in Rochester, New York, at the uh, Penny Arcade. And I have shots of uh, Bert unloading the truck out behind the club and and um, Kenny and the road crew we had walking on the beach and stuff like that. But well, I, I'm gonna... Sorry, go ahead. I got a challenge for you here. Yeah, um, yeah. for future shows, I think if you can send me one video clip that we could play at the beginning of the shows of some of your old movies, you, I mean, you got, you got a bunch of them on video too, right? I do. And if you want to send me some clips, I will be glad to play them at the beginning of our shows. And it would give people an insight into Brian Vollmer, the home movie junkie. Well, everything I did when I was a kid ended up being something that I did for a living later on and that I still do to this day. I got into filming because my grandfather used to have a movie camera and I used to take pictures. But the same thing with music. Um, I, I used to listen to my, my grandfather's country uh, albums and I used to draw. I used to write my own stories. Didn't you try to make a movie? Didn't you try to make a, didn't you try and make a movie with your with your siblings? As actors, I tried to do a video for a song called Irving, and it went. Uh, the other side was um, uh, the whole world's Jewish, I think it was. But on, on that, on this side, the the song I was trying to do was a song called Irving, and it went uh, the 142nd fast gun in the west, Irving, <laughs> Irving, and then. It, uh, he came from the old bar Nispus bread, schlepping the salami and pulper nickel dread. He always followed his mother's wishes, even on the range used two sets of dishes. <laughs> oh my God. All right. Well, listen. And then the final verse, I got to say the final verse to you. And well, finally, Irving got three slugs in the belly. It was right outside the frontier deli. He was sitting on a log, twirling his gun around, and Butterfingers Irving. Gun himself down. Oh my God. Oh and the other God. side went, uh, Frank, Frank Sinatra's Jewish, would you believe it? Sean Connery and Lyndon Johnson, too. As a matter of fact, the whole world is Jewish since I fell in love with you, Rosie McGilla. Since I fell in love with you. Oh my God! So but, this, so this was your, this is the beginning of your movie making. This is the beginning of my movie making. Oh my and, God! Uh, That's crazy. I shot Super Eight right up, uh, even after we got signed to Capitol, and I have uh, Rob Williams on my Super Eight. I have White Snake uh, backstage with Cozy Powell, <laughs> who, as you know, doesn't uh, isn't alive anymore. Um, and then eventually, I switched to video. <laughs> And uh, then I switched to uh, the little Sony mini discs. Right. And I, I have something like 200 of those. Oh, my and, God. And uh, now I just shoot on my phone or my uh, Sony camera. Mostly my you, phone though, nowadays. Now, you were going to send me then some video clips. And we'll play those. We'll play like two or three minutes of video clips at the beginning of the shows. And then you can talk about them a little bit if you want. Um, sure. But they'll just be an interesting way of introducing uh brian volmer the videographer well thank you because you're not just a musician I'm you're an artist a movie guy though if you want to really get into the technical stuff about filming then you go to brent Dern. 
Well, there's an art to all this, though, right? It's another yeah, type of art. It. When, I, when I put my films together, like I said, home movies. But yeah. I think that, see, I sat through all the editing for all the Good Looks videos back in the day. Heavy Metal Love, Rock You, Gimme Good Lovin', all that stuff. And so I had a really good feel uh, uh, for editing, where to edit, how to have the movement going into the different, uh, uh, you know, how to go into From one different- frame to the next. And I do that with my my home movies. And we used to do uh, get together for the year end Helix Christmas dinner. And uh, I'd have maybe 40 minutes put together of all the funniest stuff over the years, completely uncensored, too. Like a and, blooper. Uh, you know, everybody'd sit around and just burst a gut. And uh, I used to love doing that and see the expression on everybody's face when they saw the year. And, you know. So there's a great idea out there for indie artists. Film everything that you do as a band and then make up a, a compilation video at the end of the year and share it with the band. It's a great bonding experience. That's right. And it'll be worth money someday, too. I've had all, I have always have all sorts of people coming to me to uh, do something with my films. I just haven't uh, decided what to do yet. So Original content, brother. We can make exclusive content on the Indie Tunes Records website. We'll see what we can do. <laughs> so well, let's stay tuned. I should, split, I should split now, okay? I, I want to kick you out of here. Somewhere. Yeah, we're over our hour anyway. So uh, thanks for joining me tonight, Brian. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, once again, I'm Kenny from Indie Tunes Records, and you are not. And this has been Brian Vollmer from Helix. Thank you. Thank you. And I still thanks, my everybody. Hair. We're going to end the stream.